Welcome to our online service. We are so glad you can join us as we worship the Lord together, as we intercede uh, together, and as we wait uh, upon the Lord to listen to the message that He wants to speak to us. Uh, let us stand for the call to worship. By faith, we trust that we were created in the image of God. By faith, we hope and dream and make plans. By faith, we face our fears and insecurities. By faith, we till the soil of our lives and plant seeds of love. By faith, we follow where God leads. By faith, we trust that God is present in our midst. By, By faith, faith, we, we gather, gather in this place to, to worship, worship God, God together. together. Amen. Amen. Let us say the opening prayer together. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, I realize how quickly and easily we can move from trusting you to doubting your word, when things do not go the way that we expect. We pray that like the men and women of faith in Hebrews, our trust in you will not falter. Help us to earnestly seek you day by day, for we know that only as Christ lives in and through us by faith, can we be pleasing in your sight? In Jesus' name, Amen. Psalm 24, verse 1 to verse 6 says, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Brothers and sisters, as we gather to worship Him together, let us lift up our hearts and our eyes to our God, who owns everything in this world, and yet holds us lovingly in the palm of His hands. Amen. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me Hand the wonders wrong. 
You are a God who holds everything in your hands. Lord, we raise our voice to worship you, our true God, the God who reigns forevermore. Amen. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our That our souls to Him belong Who holds our days within His hand What comes apart from His command And what will keep us to the end The love of Christ in which we stand Oh, sing
Jesus, that you are here with us. Even though we are worshipping you in our various homes, we want to thank you that you have called us to be the body of Christ. And as we bring our intercession to you, we know that you are here with us in our homes through the Holy Spirit. And we want to pray that all our prayers will be uplifted to you and that you will hear our prayers and our petitions. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing we want to pray for is for the world, for Afghanistan. We want to pray for God's peace and presence amidst the uncertainty and for aid to pour in from other countries. The second thing we want to pray for Afghanistan is to pray for those who were unable to get out uh, on the flight so that they can be rescued. And the third thing we want to pray for is for the Christians to remain faithful for those who are in Afghanistan. Let us bring this up to the Lord. The next place we want to pray for is Myanmar. We want to pray that the Christians in Myanmar will continue to trust in the Lord as they wait for Him to reveal His plan and for their safety. We also want to pray for a peaceful resolution to the present military rule. And we want to pray for COVID treatment in the midst of the political unrest in Myanmar. Let us commit Myanmar to the Lord. The next item we want to pray for is for our own nation, Malaysia. The first thing we want to pray for is to pray for our government to formulate an effective strategy to bring the pandemic under control. Then we also want to pray for the government to have wisdom in gradually opening up sectors to restore the economy. And then we also want to pray for health services in states which are experiencing an upsurge in cases to be able to cope with the extra load. And finally, we also want to pray for our education system 
not to be crippled by the pandemic. We pray that it will prom promote critical thinking as well as inculcate social, cultural, moral, spiritual and ethical perspectives. Let us commit our nation, Malaysia, to the Lord. The next group we want to pray for is for our own church, CGMC. We want to commit to the Lord, our CGMC pastors. We want to pray for their physical, mental, emotional and spiritual protection. We also want to pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit as they continue to preach the Word of God and to shepherd their congregations. We also want to pray for the CGMC members themselves that they will continue to live a life of fellowship with each other, that the cell groups will reach out to adopt B40 families in need or contribute towards the Lighthouse Ministry. We also want to pray for all the CGMC parents that they will uh, guide and instruct their children to walk right with the Lord, to love the Lord with our God with all our hearts with all our souls and with all our strength. Let us commit CGMC, pastors, uh, uh, cell groups, members and parents to the Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord, we want to commit um, our church into your hands, Lord. We want to pray, Father, that we will continue to shine for you, that we will continue to do your will in Ipoh, that others will see Christ in CGMC. And let us unite together as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray the offertory prayer in unison. Bless these gifts that they may serve your world with power. Bless our lives that we may serve your world with love. Bless each of us that we may answer your call to lead and to serve where we are needed most. Amen.
Let us stand for the doxology. Praise God for today is taken from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 to 7. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is indeed a joy to be here. Firstly, I would like to thank God for giving me this opportunity and privilege to share His word with you once again. This sermon is entitled, Call 
to live by faith. And it is based on the book of Hebrews. Let us start with a word of prayer. Father God, holy is your name. You are worthy of all honour, glory, majesty and praise. With a word, you created the universe and it is only by you that our world is upheld. You form all things and you created a way for us to know you. Nothing is unknown to you and all things are possible for you. You alone are holy. You alone are worthy of our worship. I commit this time into your hands. Anoint me and use your servant here to speak to your people. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Well, not long after the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban was telecast in the media, WhatsApp messages pleading for prayers for the pastors and the Christians who could not get out of that country started pouring in. People were worried about them, and rightly so, because in the recent past, the Christians in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq and Syria were heavily persecuted and, and often killed. We wonder what will happen to our Christian brothers and sisters now that the Taliban has taken control of the country. Will they be able to keep their faith? Or will they be hunted down, tortured, or even killed? The church in the first century faced something similar, harassment and persecution. Remember Saul, before he became Apostle Paul? He and others like him were given a task to hunt down the early Jewish Christians and to harass them. The harassment and persecution of Christians has not stopped since then in many parts of the world even today. We thank God we are not suffering like our brothers and sisters in some other countries. However, whatever circumstances we are in, whether we are rejoicing or suffering, we are all called to live by faith. The book of Hebrews was written to the early Jewish believers in Jesus who were severely harassed. Many of them, out of fear, were thinking of abandoning their Christian faith and returning to Judaism. These Jewish believers were wavering in their faith. They were beginning to think that by accepting Christ, they had lost everything, altar, priest, sacrifice. The writer had to tell them that they had only lost a, the shadow, but they had gained the true substance in Christ. Therefore, they should not undervalue their privileges in Christ and stop engaging in wrong thinking and such as self-pity and discouragement. This applies to all of us Christians today too. We must never undervalue our privileges in Christ. We are children of God and we are together with Christ in the heavenly realms. Therefore, we must not engage in wrong thinking or wrongdoings that can stumble or even crush our faith. You know, as I was preparing this sermon, I realized that it is quite impossible to understand Hebrews chapter 11 without looking at the closing section of chapter 10, especially verses 32 to 39, which is actually a springboard for the message in chapter 11. In verse 32 to 39, the writer asks the Jewish believers to remember the early days when they first accepted Christ, how they stood firm in, facing, in the face of suffering, how they would not waver but joyfully accept the confiscation of their property because in Christ they knew they had better and lasting possessions in heaven. He was asking them not to throw away that confidence but to hold on to it for it will be richly rewarded. 
Now, do you still remember the days when you first accepted Christ? Many of us were on fire for the Lord. How about now? Are you still on fire for the Lord? Or perhaps you need to ask God to refresh your heart today. In chapter 10, verse 36, the writer urged the persecuted Jewish Christians to persevere so that after they had done the will of God, they be received what God had promised. He was asking, he said, he's still asking the same thing, asking us to do the same thing today. So what is this promise? Verse 37 and 38 tells us, For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. The writer is actually quoting Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 from the Old Testament. It is a call to live by faith no matter what is going on in your life. The promise stated here is that Jesus will come again at some point in the future and make all things right. Therefore, believers must continue to hold on to that conviction by faith or they will not be able to please God. Now in the eyes of God, we who are saved by grace are deemed righteous only if we carry on living by faith, no matter what we encounter in this life until Christ comes back again. That's the reason why this message is so important for all of us today. With all the distractions and fear of the pandemic, and economic downturn and temptations that we face every day, this message is even more important. The call to live by faith is so fundamental to the, for the church. Even if you are a new Christian, but if you have been in church for some time, you would have learned that we are saved by grace through faith. It is so fun fundamental and so important to our lives as believers. We can't have a relationship with God without faith. There is no Christianity without faith in God. Chapter 11 verse 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now the call to live by faith according to the Word of God is especially important in these modern days where we have what is called the faith movement, which is part of evangelical Christianity and the charismatic movement. These people talk a lot, a lot about the power of faith. However, their teaching is unbiblical, misleading and dangerous. When they talk about the power of faith, they are creating a faith in people's mind that does not exist. They are trying to empower a powerless faith. The sad thing is that when they talk about the power of faith, they are talking about faith as if it were power we possess to create our own future, to get something for ourselves. A personal power we possess to create our own reality, literally believing things into being. So, as you are driving along the road and you see a nice house that you like and you claim it by faith and believe that the house will be yours one day, I doubt this wishful thinking will ever come true. It's very different if you see a house and you, 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 you like it and you say to yourself, hey, you know, I'm going to work very hard and when I have enough money, I will come and purchase this house. That might work. You see, brothers and sisters, biblical faith is never like that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36 to 37 tells us that because of faith, some of God's people face jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed into two 
and they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. But the prosperity preachers tell their followers that they have the power of faith that can bring healing to their sickness, that can change their economic situation, that can take them from poverty to wealth, from deprived to being prosperous, from being a failure to being successful, from being a nobody to being a somebody. Really? Is that a description of faith in the Bible? Now Hebrews chapter 11 is well known as the great faith chapter or the hall of faith chapter. It gives us the right description of Christian faith. Now, this chapter gives us a long list of all the heroes of faith in the Old Testament, right back to Abel, Enoch, and Noah in the book of Genesis. It shows us examples after examples of men and women in the past during the pre-Christian era who lived by faith and were commanded by God. It presents to us the biblical concept of faith, the essence of faith, and the power of Christian faith in the life of those who have gone before us. And it also answers three important questions for all of us. First, what is faith? Number two, what does it mean to live by faith in God? And number three, how does faith change our lives? Let us start with the first point, yeah? the biblical concept of faith. It answers the question, what is faith? Biblical concept of faith is totally different from the way the world understands the word faith. Verse 1 tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You know, the Amplified Bible gave an interesting translation. It says, now faith is the assurance, something like a title deed or confirmation of things hoped for. And it puts in bracket, divinely guaranteed and evidence of things not seen. I like, I like this translation. Okay, let's look at the first part. Of verse 1. What does it tell us? It tells us that faith is the assurance of what we hope for. Okay. Now the word assurance here uh, is from the Greek word called hypothesis. Right? Hypothesis. Yeah. Not hypothesis, but hypothesis. Okay. This word is used in legal documents. To describe a piece of property owned by someone, it is evidence of ownership or a title deed, if you like. The writer of Hebrews is telling us that faith is the evidence, like a title deed, that makes what we hope for real. In other words, my faith shows you what I hope for is tangibly real. Just like my title deed shows you that my ownership of a property is tangibly mine. Now the tangibility or the evidence of my hope is found in my faith in God. Let us now look at the, the other word, hope. Okay, We use hope frequently in our daily lives. But rarely do we use it in a biblical sense. We always say, I hope the well is good tomorrow, or I hope she likes it, to express a wish. But this has no correlation with a biblical idea of hope. The thing that makes our hope different is our God. The assurance of what we hope for, which is, of 
cost eternal life comes from knowing God. Although the blessed blessings promised has yet to come, a man or woman of faith is already convinced of their reality. This same conviction caused Apostle Paul to say that his suffering in doing the will of God is nothing compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. He was looking forward to eternal life. Despite being persecuted, he never gave up his faith. Toza described our hope of life in this way. Yeah. And he says, Upon God's faithfulness rests our whole hope of future blessedness. Only as he is faithful, will his covenant stand and his promises honoured. Only as we have complete assurance that he is faithful, may we live in peace and look forward to an assurance to the life to come. So what is Tozer saying? Tozer is saying that our hope of eternal life rests completely on God's faithfulness. Unless God is faithful, His covenant will not stand and His promises will not be honoured. Unless we have complete confidence that God is faithful, we cannot live in peace and we cannot look forward with certainty to the life to come, which we do not see. In other words, Tozer is saying that faith is the conviction in the heart of the believer and the evidence of what we do not see. Now as human beings, we rely a lot on our senses, especially our eyesight. As the saying goes, seeing is believing. However, we know that there are many things in this world that we cannot see with our eyes nor touch with our hands. We cannot see radio waves, for example, yeah. but we know they connect us to the Wi-Fi. We can't see gravity, but we know a fall from a high building can kill us. We can't see what's in a person's mind or in his thoughts, but we know they exist. Our physical senses are unable to help us with such things. What more? with spiritual things and things of God. We can't see God, but He can speak to us through His words. Faith is the ability God has given to us to enable us to see beyond what the physical sight can see and believing in reasons that cannot be measured in a laboratory. Faith produces in us a conviction of spiritual things of God, which is invisible to the physical eye. Now that we have a proper description of biblical faith, we can see clearly that it is, it is not just bare belief or intellectual understanding alone. It, biblical faith is the willingness to trust Him to rely on and to cling to God and His promises in the scripture. Biblical faith is trusting in God's faithfulness and being confident in what He says. It is not simply positive feeling. Actually, it's not feeling at all. It's not a feeling at all. It is also not blind optimism. Blind optimists feel better by refusing to face up to reality, and that can be dangerous. So that is not biblical faith. Biblical faith is also not wishful thinking, like, I hope our team wins. Wishful thinking has no solid foundation like biblical faith. You know, sometimes we meet people of uh, different faith, 
And despite showing them evidence after evidence, after evidence, they just turn around and tell you that even if their religion is proven false, they will never leave you. That is not faith. That is blindness. Let me just sum up point number one so that we know for sure that biblical faith is different from what the world understands. Biblical faith is definitely not, definitely not positive feelings, blind optimism, wishful thinking or blind faith. It is also not a power you possess to create your own future or get something for yourself. Neither is faith merely bare belief or intellectual understanding alone. Biblical faith is trusting in God and His Word. Biblical faith, faith proves to the mind the reality of things that cannot be seen by the physical eye. It produces a conviction inside the believer and the willingness of the believer to trust him, to rely on and to cling to what God says. Now let's come to the essence of Christian faith. What does it mean to live by faith in God? Verse 2 tells us that the ancient were commanded for their faith. What does that mean? What does it mean to live by faith like the ancient, Christ, ancient believers? Firstly, the Old Testament people of faith know God, know who is God, and they believe what God says. The heroes of faith in the pre-Christian era live a life that clearly shows that they know God and believe in the existence of the invisible but living God. None of them has seen God like Adam and Eve. But they believe that God created the universe and all of creation, even though they were not there when the universe and all of creation came into being. They just believe by faith. Secondly, their lives clearly shows their willingness to trust in, rely on, and cling to the Word of God under very challenging and difficult circumstances, and sometimes to the point of losing their lives. They trust in what God says, and they respond by doing the will of God, no matter how costly it was to them. Thirdly, they live with the confidence and conviction that God will fulfill the promise He made to those who know Him, believe in Him, and trust Him. They worship God by faith. They walk with God by faith. They wait upon God by faith. And they endure trials and tribulations by faith. They accept and trust God's words and they willingly lean upon God in all circumstances. That's the reason why they are revered and highly praised for their faith. What about today? Today we praise them too because they have given us exemplary, exemplary models to follow in believing and trusting God and obeying His commands. Each time we read about them, we are inspired to hold on to the conviction that God loves us. He is with us now and He has great plans to bless us in the days to come. And we rejoice in the Lord. This is the reason why Hebrews chapter 11 was written. It is to inspire us to look forward to the living hope. Now let's have a look at the heroes of faith. Right, let's look at Abel's life of faith. Verse 4 tells us about Abel's life of faith. Like his elder brother Cain, Abel must have heard their parents Adam and Eve talking about God and their time in the Garden of Eden before they were expelled. 
Cain and Abel were probably taught the proper way to worship and to give offerings to God and how to honour the invisible God. Now this verse tells us that Abel worshipped God by faith. He honoured God in his offering of the firstborn of his flock. He willingly presented the best of what he had and that pleased God. Unfortunately, Cain did not do likewise. He did not present the best he had to God and neither did he offer to God the first of what he had. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain and was commanded as a righteous man. Now, what Abel has given us is a fine example to follow. And he still speaks to us, even though he is dead a long, long time ago. Abel teaches us that faith means to embrace God's word and commands. But it also means to act upon them. His faith and his action worked together to please God. In James chapter 2 verse 14, James asked the early Christians, What good is, is it if somebody claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? This shows us that biblical faith is not just bare belief or intellectual understanding alone, but the willingness to trust God and to act upon it. Abel's life of faith and his act shines like a bright star from the distant past. What about Enoch? Enoch's walk of faith. Verse 5 tells us that by faith, Enoch did not experience death because he was taken away by God. How is that possible when everyone else is living under the shadows of sin and death? since the great fall from the Garden of Eden. Verse 5 tells us that Enoch's walk of faith pleased God so much that God granted him the glory of ascension to heaven without experiencing death. Genesis chapter 5 verse 21 to 24 tells us that Enoch walked with God for 300 years before he was taken to heaven. The Hebrew word for walk in verse 24 is yit hale, yit and it means to subject oneself to follow. So walking with God here means more than just traveling together with God. You know? It refers to taking each step in accordance to God's will without having different thoughts. It refers to a close and intimate associ association with God. There was no changing of heart for Enoch during his 300 years walk with God. He willingly and joyfully followed God and embraced God's will in his heart. That, my friends, is biblical faith. And it is this that pleased God and the reward was a direct ascension to heaven without seeing death. What an amazing achievement. Like Abel, Enoch is another example for all of us today. He was the first to teach mankind that whoever walks with God in faith will obtain eternal life. Enoch's walk of faith pleased God and God transfigured him, transformed him and took him to heaven without having him seen that. Enoch is still teaching us today that walking in faith willingly and joyfully with all our hearts please God and God will reward us with a place in heaven. Let us now look at Noah. Noah's act of faith. Abel and Enoch live in a time when Adam was still alive and both would have heard much about God from Adam himself. Enoch was the seventh generation
from the genealogy of faith that begins from Adam's son Seth, while Noah was the tenth generation from the same line. But Noah was born 126 years after Adam's death. So Noah never met Adam, Abel, or even Enoch. But he would have heard much about God through his father, the Mark, his grandfather, Methuselah, and his great-great-grandfather, Gerard. Enoch was Noah's great-grandfather, uh, by the way. Now, these patriarchs were all men of faith. Abel and Enoch were revered for their act of faith. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes in our walk with God, we are required to take a leap of faith with nothing to hold us up except His promise. And His promise is enough. Noah is perhaps the most popular biblical character for children. The Bible tells us that during Noah's time, the world was so ungodly and wicked that God regretted that He made man. The world was so corrupted that God could not find one godly person except in Noah and his family. This preacher of righteousness found favour in the eyes of God. God warned Noah about the impending judgment by flood. God appeared to Noah and gave him precise instruction for the construction of the ark in preparation for the great flood to end all flesh. Now Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 7 tells us why Noah was able to complete all that God has commanded him. It was by faith. It says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not seen, in holy fear, Noah built the ark to save his family. The word holy fear describes here, describes a heart which with reverence and fear and trembling, strives to obey God's word, which is spoken only once, and it remains with Noah until the end. By faith, Noah prepared the ark for an extended duration of two, 120 years for a flood he has not yet seen. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, Everything is possible for him who believes. The world says, I need to see first, then I believe. But Jesus says, yeah, Believe first, and then you will see. And very interestingly, St. Augustine wrote, Faith is to believe what we do not see. The reward of faith is to see what we believe. Isn't that interesting? Now, Noah's obedience and perseverance in building the ark make him a man of great faith. James chapter 4 verse 17 says that faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And he went on to say, Show me your faith without thee, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Faith is not about words, but rather about deeds. Faith changes the way Noah and his family live their life. It carries a cost, and it requires action. Their reward was a safe passage through the storm and flood into a period of rest from God's wrath. Let me now come to the third point. Let's talk about the power of Christian faith. How does faith change the lives of believers? God's word is called the word of faith. And faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of God. God's word has the power to create faith in the hearts of believers. 
and faith has the power to transform our lives. Firstly, faith changes the way we see ourselves and things around us. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, the Bible tells us that our old self is gone and our new self has come. We receive spiritual blessings and we begin to see ourselves as a new creation in Christ and a child of God. We realize that we have a living fellowship with God, both now and forevermore. Eternal life is in us and it goes on as long as our faith remains. Having faith does not mean a life without trials or difficulty. It means that God promised to be with us all the time through thick and thin and give us wisdom and strength in those challenging times, guiding and helping us in our journey in life. Our understanding of things around us also changes. We no longer see the universe and all of creation as the world sees them. Our understanding that the universe was formed at God's command is accepted as a fact. This new understanding, as written in verse 3, is derived from faith and not from our own reasoning. Secondly, Faith changes the way we live our lives. Abel's life was transformed when he heard the message about how to worship and honour God with his offerings for the forgiveness of sin. It inspires him to worship and offer his best to God, and God was pleased. Enoch's life became the foremost testimony of eternal life. His life became a great encouragement and hope for the righteous who thirst for the good news of eternal life while living in the shadows of sin and death. Enoch attained a proper image of man that God had wanted from Adam, a man who is one heart and one will with his Creator, just like Jesus Christ our Lord. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. Adam failed to live up to that image of holiness, so he died, despite being the first man God created. Verse 6 reminds us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Noah's life was turned upside down when he received God's warning about the great flood and the call to prepare the ark. From that point on, Noah and his family labored to build the ark over a long period, faithfully and with reverence for God. They were rewarded with a period of peace from God's wrath. Faith has the power to transform us from the inside out. It is life-changing. We grow spiritually as we feed on God's Word. Faith drives us to gather together with other Christians to share our faith, to encourage one another, to worship God together. It makes us reject the wrong things in our lives and embrace the fulfilling life that God has to offer, living a life as though living for God. We are driven to serve others in our local church or our community and to tell others the good news. Faith helps us to work towards attaining the proper image of man that God had intended, which Adam failed to achieve, but was fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ. We live by faith, no matter how challenging or difficult our lives may be, because the Word of God says in Hebrew chapter six, chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. As believers, we acknowledge God's existence and that He rewards those who seek Him earnestly. Faith gives us the power and the strength to live godly lives.
So, brothers and sisters, we are all called to live by faith. We live by faith because Jesus tells us in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishes of men. In John chapter 12, verse 26, he says, Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servants will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. In Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely, I will be with you always to the very end of age. In John chapter 15, verse 18 to 19, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hates me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The call to live by faith requires our response in accordance to his will. It comes with a cost, but it also comes with a promise of great reward to all who live by faith till the very end. Let us pray. Father, Father God, thank you that we can call you Abba Father. Thank you that we can know you by name and call you by your name. What an amazing gift. A gift that we truly do not deserve. And yet it is freely given to us by your Son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for our salvation. You give us hope for the future. Help us, O oh Lord, to live a faith to live by faith, no matter what the circumstances we are in on earth. Thank you. All honour and glory is yours, Almighty God. Amen.
now let's rise to receive this benediction. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.